Hello there and welcome back to video number two in which we'll be looking at the morphology of our three major groups of mollusks. So without further ado I will move on um, and we will start by learning about the morphology of the cephalopods after a quick introduction. So as before there are some long words here I'm afraid. The ones that I figure are important I've put just above this video, up there somewhere, um, and those ones you may want to label on a diagram as you go along to help you remember. But the um, the important thing is to, I think, be able to um, recognize these fossils in a rock and label the basic bits of their anatomy, hence my choice of those words. So we're starting with the cephalopods. Cephalopods comprise two living group. One of those includes the octopodes, the squid and the cuttlefish. Uh, the other includes the living nautiloids. There are relatively few of these, which are creatures that have an external coil shell, a thin internal mantle, and nearly 100 tentacles. There is also a really important extinct group called the Ammonoidea, which has coil shells and complex suture lines. I'll be explaining what suture lines are in just a minute. These were around from the early Devonian through to the latest Cretaceous or possibly the earliest Paleogene, but are now extinct. Cephalopods are arguably the most complex of the mollusks. For example, the eye of the octopus and the squid um, is just as complex and in some ways better than the human eye. So they're really, really neat animals. Um, all cephalopods have a well-defined head and a foot that has been modified into tentacles. So the, um, the tentacles of say a squid or the arms of an octopus are the equivalent of the foot, which is that, that structure that a slug or a snail will crawl along on. They are carnivorous. They typically have a very high metabolic rate and they're very mobile. In fact, their um, mobility, their, their motion is really, really cool. They have a funnel or a hyponome. This is a specialized structure, which is a modified portion of the foot. It squirts out water from the mental cavity. And as a result, they, uh, the animals move. And this means they're actually jet propelled. That's pretty cool, right? Um, they have also a really well-developed nervous system. Their origins lie in the Lake Cambrian. So we're gonna have a quick look at the morphology of these groups. On the left of this slide, you can see an example of a nautilus. And on the right of this group, you can see an example of an ammonoid. We're not going to be looking too heavily into the um, morphology of the uh, octopodes, the squid or the cuttlefish because they don't preserve that often in the fossil record. So looking at the left here, you can see a nautilus. The nautilus is alive today. It's a nocturnal predator or a scavenger. It has a chambered shell that you can see from the outside here and from the inside there. Um, in that shell, we have a head, tentacles, and a foot, and a hyponome. Uh, this is the, uh, the funnel-like uh, organ, which it, is, it uses for um, jet propulsion, and all of those are concentrated near the opening of the body chamber in which it lived. So this is, um, you can see the body chamber here in cross section. The shell in these groups is often called the phragmacone. That's actually a specific part of the shell we'll highlight later. And the mantle, um, so this uh, bit of the body that excretes the shell extends posteriorly through the rest of the creature as a structure called the siphuncle, which you can see here. This connects the now gas-filled cham uh, chambers that are used for buoyancy, but all of those used to be the body chamber. This animal grows by adding chambers. Each of these chambers is partitioned from those adjacent to it by a sheet of calcareous material. This sheet is called the septum. Where the septum hits the edge of the shell, we have a thing called the suture. So this is where the, um, the suture is where the septum is cemented to the outer shell. Fossil nautiloids developed a wide range of shell morphologies and lifestyles. Far more, um, they were far more diverse or disparate, we may say, based on what we learned last lecture, than those uh, nautiloids that remain alive today. On the right here, you can see our ammonites. So 
or ammonoids, sorry, I should say. Ammonoids look superficially similar. Their shell comprises um, the original embryonic form of the animal called the protoconch, then the phragmacone. This is the remaining um, parts of the shell to the exclusion of the body chamber that um, occurs uh, just here near the, um, uh, near, well, it's the opening, I should say, of the animal. These animals also have a siphuncle, so the ammonoids also have a siphuncle, but this is gen generally situated along the outer ventral margin of the cell. So instead of the middle here, as you see in the nautiloid, in ammonites, it's actually here towards the outside. The phragmacone is chambered, as with nautiloids, and each chamber marks a successive occupation of the, by the animal. But the scepter um, are far more complex in structure. We'll see some more about this in the next slide. And this means that the sutures are also far more complex in structure. In all of the animals that we're going to be looking at, which have this kind of um, uh, circular form of shell, um, we'll come across the word whirl. Spent spelled W-H-O-R-L. You can see uh, an example of it in use here. And the whirl is the name for a 360 degree revolution or turn in the spiral growth of a mollusk shell. Okay, so uh, one 360 degree turn of this is called one whirl. We'll be coming back to that in the gastropods because they have a vaguely similar shell shape. Within the ammonoids, sorry, I just bashed my chair into my desk. My bad there. Maybe my noise filter cut it out, who knows? Um, the, anyway, yes, the scepter in um, ammonoids are folded, presumably to give the organisms uh, and the shell some strength. And this gives rise to a complex pattern of frilled lobes and saddles on the sutures of derived forms that you can see on the, the uh, left here. So I wouldn't worry too much about the terminolo terminology lobes or saddles. Just be aware that in these groups, we can use the form of this suture line um, across the shell to understand something about the, especially the relationships within this group. It's very important for the taxonomy and the phylogeny within the group. Indeed, as you can see on the right, the um, three suture lines is really important to find for defining members of the ammonoids. And there are three, these are all ammonoids shown on the right here. So ammonoids is the encompassing group within which we find these three groups, the goniotites, the serotites, and the ammonites. So the goniotites, you can see um, an example of one of the uh, sutures in the bottom here, have sharp lobes and rounded saddles. And these are typical of late Devonian to Permian ammonoids. Just above this, you can see the serotite suture lines, and these have frilled lobes and undivided saddles. So you can see a typical serotite suture line here with these frills on the lower bits. In ammonite suture lines, um, all bets are essentially off. Uh, sutures uh, have both lobes and saddles fluted or frilled, and these, this group is dominant throughout the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And as a rule of thumb, um, this kind of uh, gradation is, is quite reliably followed. You can go through from gonotite, serotite to ammonite um, through time, with the caveat that some Cretaceous species may have goniotitic or serotitic grades of suture. So that messes stuff up slightly. Okay, so it's a good rule of thumb that the uh, suture lines will follow this form, but that's not universally true. As the image on the left of this slide here shows, there are a number of different shell shapes. And I would encourage you after this lecture to go th back through the video and identify which shell um, shape on the left corresponds to which shell shape on the right, just to get a feeling for um, the diversity of forms within this group. So the exact taxonomy of the ammonites, how they're split up into different subgroups, will actually differ between where you look. Different people have different ideas about how this works. So for our purposes, I think it's okay just to remember that you have goniotites, serotites, and ammonites. Here on this slide, we can see primarily non-ammonite ammonoids. But note that on the top left here, um, 
a you can see a cheeky little nautiloid slipping in there they're really cool creatures so that's a nautiloid the rest of these let's ignore h for the moment there other than h b to e um or b to f i should say sorry um are non ammonite ammonoids we have the goniotites and close relatives of these in panels b to e and you can see in here the relatively simple suture structure, whereas F and G are examples of serotypes. Their, their suture structure is a tiny bit more complex. If we compare this one to the last slide, we'll see that these, these are now ammonites. And as where you can see them, for example, you can see some hints of the suture lines here in L, and there are some here in M. I'll show you a close-up of these in the next video, so I wouldn't worry too much about it if you can't see them on my slides. Um, the, there are some really weird uh, and very complex suture lines in these creatures. So these are examples of our ammonites. Um, be also aware that at times there are some really weird forms of ammonite that were around that didn't really follow our expected shell shape. Uh, there are examples of those in N to P that are drawn from the Cretaceous period, though they, these, these kind of weird shell shapes do occur elsewhere in the uh, geological column. These groups are called heteromorphs because they don't really follow the shape that we expect for an ammonite. Some of them have these nice loose spirals. Uh, some of them just have no seeming arrangement to their shell at all. So just be aware that those exist. There is one common representative of that grouping I mentioned, which includes squid, octopodes, and cuttlefish. These are the coleoids, FYI, you may need to remember that. Um, so the squid, octopodes, and cuttlefish are soft and squishy, so they don't generally preserve all that well. Um, therefore, I haven't talked about them. However, I wanted you to be aware that the skeletons of an extinct member of this group called the Belemnites are locally extremely abundant in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous and rocks from that time period. And this is because they have a hard internal skeleton. Um, so compare this to the um, Ammonites where the skeleton is external. These um, chaps and chapesses had a little internal skeleton. Their soft parts don't often preserve, but more on that in a second but their skeleton does. And their skeleton, we can see some examples here, comprises three main parts. There's a bullet-shaped guard that you can see here. This is also called the rostrum. It's solid and it's composed of radially arranged needles of calcite. That's a key thing to recognizing these in the fossil record. At the anterior end of this, it has there's a little conical depression that you'll quite often see in your fossils that houses the tip of the phragmacone. This is the chambered part. Um, relative to the other cephalopods that we've just met. There are, in that, there are concave septa, and there's a ventral siphuncle. And these parts are all analogous to the chambered shells of nautiloids and ammonoids, in case you hadn't got that. Occasional soft part preservation suggests that these creatures were largely comparable in terms of their overall morphology to, for example, the squid. Like the ammonoids, they went extinct um, between the um, Cretaceous and the Paleogene. And the guards are very common in Mesozoic rocks. You can see a, a series of examples that I've drawn, uh, so I haven't drawn these, that I've drawn from my source um, on the right here, showing you some of the variety of form of these things. But if you see something that's made of radially um, concentric calcite um, that looks a bit like a bullet in, the, in a rock, it may well be a belemnite. Moving swiftly on, then I want to talk about the gastropods. So these are the most varied or abundant of the molluscan clades that we're talking about that are around today. It includes the snails and the slugs. Slugs have obviously lost their shell to an extent. Uh, and we have a wide range of, mode of life, modes of life within this group over their long geological history, which spans from, through, from marine all the way through to terrestrial environments. It must be said, these are kind of weird creatures, as you will see as I go through their anatomy. They're known for their shell, which is spiraled. You can see some nice examples of different forms of spiral and shape here. Um, and it's usually made of aragonite. Often it's conical with a closure posteriorly at a pointed apex. This is a really nice um, example of that typical shell, shell shape here. You can see the apex at the top and this conical form there. And one well you can see marked here. 
The shell is normally orientated with the aperture facing forwards and the apex facing upwards, again, as you see here, but that's not always the case, it depends on the group. And these are slightly unusual, as I just alluded to, in the fact that they have a thing called torsion of their bodies. They twist their mental cavity around as they grow, and as a result, for example, their excretory and reproductive openings lie directly above their head. Um, I'll let you uh, imagine what that actually means, for example, when they're, that it comes to, for example, uh, their excretion of uh, their waste products. We don't really know why this is selected for. In fact, it means that they, in many cases they have to lose uh, one of their gills, but clearly there, there is a, a selection for this particular arrangement because it's relatively common. During their development, they have a fixed and then a sweet, a sweet, a free swimming a stage in their life cycle. And torsion occurs throughout that development um, where except the head and foot, everything else is rotated through 180 degrees as they grow. Um, there are lots of words for the different bits of the shell. The important ones I think I've already largely covered, but you should ideally remember the aperture. This means an opening to the shell, the apex, and this is the tip and the whorl, that one single 360 degree spiral of the shell. There are a wide variety of shell shapes. Just check out on the right here. Um, including, for example, the limpets. You can see that example up here. And what we have traditionally called conches. So there's this whole variety of form within the gastropods. Just be aware that um, many of the ones you'll see in the fossil record do have this nice distinctive shell shape that you can see here, um, but not all of them do. If you want to learn more about them, there is actually more information in the, um, the, the, the course book for this, um, course text for this um, particular module. So I wanted to finish today by talking about the bivalves. The bivalves are common components of beach sands. Many indeed are also farmed for human consumption. Think of mussels and oysters. Those are bivalves. And they're such so named because they have they are a twin valved shellfish. There are, however, a wide range of shell shapes and life strategies within this grouping. Their history spans the entire Phanerozoic period. The shells are always composed of calcium carbonate, usually, but not always, in the form of aragonite. Many, but not all, will have a planar symmetry parallel to the commissure. So the commissure is the name for the opening that separates the left and the right valves from each other. So if we've got left and right in this line of symmetry before between them, that means that when we're looking at one of the shells, the top here is the dorsal, and the opening here is the ventral, um, aspect of this animal, and then we have anterior and posterior. Kind of, it's a bit weird um, in terms of having to remember these directions. What's interesting is that much of the head is lost, and the sensory organs, as said, are located on the mantle margins, and these include eye spots and chemoreceptor. Chemoreceptors. So when these things are open, they can sense chemicals and they can see light um, through the bits of their anatomy that they're presenting to the outside. The left and the right valves meet dorsally along a hinge line. They're opened by an elastic ligament that pushes the shells open. And the hinge at this end on the dorsal surface is usually made of interlocking teeth and sockets. The valves then open ventrally, as I mentioned, where the mantle which secretes the shell um, attaches to the shell, there is a um, a line called the paleal line. This is often indented. You can see an example of this here, um, where um, siphons, which are used in life for moving water in and out of the cavity are, into a thing called the paleal sinus. This is this um, indentation here. The valves are closed by a pair of adductor muscles. So these are things that pull them back together. Um, anteriorly and posteriorly, you can see examples here which leave muscle scars when the creature is dead. So the arrangement of the teeth um, and the nature of the adductor uh, scars and indeed this paleal line and paleal sciences are all very useful for identifying members of this group.
The other thing I want to highlight is that this beak, which is the first bit of the animal that starts growing, is often called the umbo. So just bear that in mind. In addition to um, identific identification of these groups based on their um, hinge structure, the gill structure um, is used to separate uh, different members of this group for, for each other. So to, to primarily split them apart into different groups. I, you can see the different arrangements that, I've, that we have in the group on the bottom left here, but I don't think they're important for you to learn at this stage. Obviously, if you ever wanted to learn more about bivalves, that is an important subdivision. Earliest examples in the fossil record we know were marine shallow burrowers, but actually um, this group has since evolved both epifaunal, um, so lying on the sediment, deep burrowing, and indeed boring strategies. These are creatures that dig into the rock, which you can see examples of on this slide here. They've also since migrated into fresh water. So in the top left here, you can see examples of our shallow on our deep burrowers in soft, to firm substrates, but things you can dig in. So shallow in faunal is near the surface and deep in faunal is further from the surface. And many of these creatures use inhale, their inhalant and exhalant siphon to bring water into their uh, cavity um, and then to, uh, to uh, remove it from the cavity and use this to conduct filter feeding. There are a series of epifaunal uh, forms. These could be swimming attached to or resting on soft to firm substrates. Famous example of this here is Gryphea, which is very uh, common in Mesozoic rocks across the UK, sometimes called the devil's toenails, as we learned in the first lecture. And if you have firm or really hard substrates, so rocks, um, you have there are forms that can actually bore into these and make cavities in which they can live. All of these different forms can be identified from the morphology of the shell. And I've put a handy diagram just below this video um, to help you identify these different forms. And I would like you to have a look at that and just make sure you follow the chain of logic for each different form as to how we can identify this different mode of life. Because that's really, really handy as we'll learn about in video three. And I wanted to finish with just a quick note, beware the rudists. So these were unusual bivalves that ranged in age from the late Jurassic through to the late Cretaceous. So you can see some examples of what they look like in this slide here. They had this bizarre range of morphologies and many groups uh, looked a lot like corals. In fact, they were probably mimicking corals. They were in equivalves, meaning their valves were not the same shape or size with a large uh, attached valve, usually the right valve in conventional terminology, and a small cap-like free valve on top that would open up. Thus, if you're looking at rocks in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, and you see things that look like this, and you're tempted to say, hey, what we've got here, those are some corals, just beware that it's possible that these could be rudest bivalves. Okay, so um, you can probably work out what they are, in fact are, um, based on both what you'll be learning about the forms of corals that were around in the Mesozoic from our corals lecture and through understanding the geological history of the area. And actually, once you get to know them, rudists are quite um, easy to identify in rocks. You've just got to see a few in, in, in the field and you'll get an idea for what they look like. So with that, that brings us to the end of video two. That was a whistle-stop tour of the morphology of these different groups. I would encourage you to perhaps go back over this and label a few diagrams, which I'll provide on the blackboard for these different forms, for the, the important bits that you want to remember um, of the morphology of these groups. You can build up a bit of a, a kind of a handbook of fossil morphology. And I'll meet you again in video three in just a minute in where, in which, sorry, we'll be looking at why these creatures are useful to geologists um, and what they look like when you find them in rocks. See you in a minute.